Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and also, of course, to everyone who made this possible and to all the speakers from the amazing sessions that we've heard uh, in the morning. So the story that I'd like to tell you about today is about um, methodology development fundamentally. And it's the story of going to bigger magnets, faster magic angle spinning, and a stronger de detection nucleus, in this case, protons. Um, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my geographic trajectory. I started off in Boulder, Colorado, and I basically went east and north. That's uh, much more random than it appears. I grew up at the foothills of the Rockies and mountains like these, and I enjoyed a lot of outdoor activities, skiing, hiking, fishing, uh, you name it. Um, and I had an interest in early on in, in building things and making things. It seemed like an exciting way to con contribute. And that's me on the right there with uh, partly unfinished uh, viola that I, I made in those days. So I figured that uh, with my interest in, in building things, I should become an engineer, or a mechanical engineer, I thought. Uh, and uh, I was all set to go to engineering school in Colorado. But then at the last moment, I was uh, bumped off the wait list at Oberlin College, and I changed plans and decided that a liberal arts college would be a more uh, interesting uh, place to be at an intersection that would allow me to be around much more music. Um, and at Oberlin, I started to take chemistry courses, only because I really had to for the engineering. Um, but I, I got more and more interested in, in it, really enjoying these courses. Um, and I did undergraduate research with Manish Mehta. This is my first publication with him, where uh, we became interested in the problem of protein folding. As you probably know, the fold of complicated biological molecules is not easy to predict. And so there's a large effort by a variety of experimental techniques to determine those structures. Um, and this is the well-known protein folding problem. In this case, we started off with uh, what you might jokingly call a monoprotein, in this case, the structure of a single uh, amino acid histidine. Uh, but this, this is about the method development that we started here and then continued. From there, I went on to do a PhD with Bob Griffin at MIT. Um, and I learned a lot in, in Bob's lab, a lot more about NMR there. Um, and I'd like to repeat one of the things that Bob likes to say, and that is that there are really three important things in uh, NMR. And those three things are first, sensitivity. The second thing is sensitivity. And you probably guessed that the third thing is still sensitivity. Um, this is really true, that uh, if we only had more sensitivity, we could do uh, many, many things. We could go to higher dimensional spectra. We can trade some uh, resolution. We can resolution enhance by trading some sensitivity. And in Bob's lab, our method of enhancing the signals was something called dynamic nuclear polarization. Uh, basically, this amounts to using the stronger polarization from electrons, transferring them to nuclei, uh, and then detecting. And with this, we can achieve orders of magnitude signal enhancement. But to do this, we needed a lot of specialized equipment, which in that lab was often home built. Here you see a much tidier uh, image of that equipment with a gyrotron oscillator, microwave waveguide, uh, sample temperatures of around 100 Kelvin, cryoprotectants, doping the sample with radicals. Um, and to do this, we could uh, determine, interesting, um, determine interesting biological features of molecules, in this case, a membrane protein. Really, the important part, as I just introduced, is that uh, with this kind of technology, we can study these proteins in a very near-native context. I haven't actually done work in whole cells, but in this case, what I mean by near-native is for a membrane protein in a lipid bilayer environment. And sometimes this in, it turns out to be extremely important to be sure that we're studying the structure of the molecule in its native environment, in its native structure. Uh, after my PhD, I moved to Europe. I went to France uh, to work in the group of Cuido Pintacuda uh, at the High Field uh, NMR Center in Lyon, also under the scientific direction of Lyndon Emsley. And here the focus was on a different method for sensitivity enhancement, uh, which you might call a brute force uh, method in some ways going to the strongest magnetic fields we possibly can, spinning faster and detecting uh, protons. On this slide, you can see we could now reach um, considerably larger molecules. And what we did here was to determine the structure of the, dynamic, uh, the, the basic dimeric unit 
inside intact nucleocapsids of 2.5 megadaltons in size, something that um, we were, were quite uh, proud to see that we could do with this technology. So here I'd like to explain a little bit um, what we do uh, in, in magic angle spinning and NMR in general, we uh, orient our sample at a particular angle and spin. And this transforms a very broad spectrum that we would have in a static sample to a narrow spectrum that you'll, you are all probably familiar with, what we like to call solution-like spectra on the right. And this shows here a carbon spectrum. So what we'd like to do is be able to apply this same technology but detect protons because Protons have a four times larger gyromagnetic ratio, meaning a four times larger magnetic moment for detection. But to do this, we need to spin much faster. And the bottom here, you can see the progression of uh, rotor sizes over the years getting smaller and smaller, which allows us to spin faster and faster. And these last two here are what really, uh, this is the technological breakthrough that really allows uh, us to make uh, an advancement and to detect protons do proton detected spectroscopy more generally. And all of this we need to do at the highest magnetic fields that, that are possible, which until recently was one gigahertz. This shows visually the improvement that we can reach when we spin faster, going from 40 kilohertz up to 111 kilohertz uh, magic angle spinning just for a model protein. Uh, in addition, we can, we can get the sample required down to half a milligram. This is very important for many of the membrane proteins that we're interested in. Uh, since they can only be expressed in limited quantities. Now, the magnetic field, as I mentioned already, also plays an important role, not just in the sensitivity, but also in the resolution. And this slide shows the progression from 500 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. And we're very excited to see uh, what, what will be possible with 1.2 gigahertz spectroscopy, uh, which has just been announced at the NMR conferences, which actually coincide exactly with this one. Uh, that the instrument manufacturer has now um, brought to field and hom homogenized a magnet at 1.2 gigahertz. So we're excited to uh, be able to use this soon. Um, just one slide with a lot of numbers uh, uh, to quantify uh, the improvement. Uh, a lot of these numbers are, are a bit different from sample to sample, but if we add up many different small improvements, we can really have a, a big step change in the sensitivity, allowing us to apply this spectroscopy more broadly. So we get modest improvements with magnetic field, a large improvement with uh, move to protons. Then we need smaller uh, rotors. This results in some signal loss, but it's made up for by having a detection coil, which is very tightly around the sample, has a stronger inductive coupling to the sample. We can often recycle the experiment, repeating the experiment faster. This gives us some additional improvement. And finally, uh, we have longer coherence lifetimes. This means that our signal survives through our complicated pulse sequences and reaches the end for detection. And if we add this all together, we can come up with numbers of approximately 4 to 10 in improvement in sensitivity, which may not sound like much. Uh, but considering the time needed goes as the square, this really leads to orders of magnitude improvement in the experiment time that we need for these, uh, these studies. So in a nutshell, taking a real example, uh, we just calculated this recently. Uh, during my PhD days, we had uh, used mainly carbon-detected methods for uh, structure determination of this membrane protein. It took seven different isotopically labeled samples, months of data, and we could only do two-dimensional spectroscopy for sensitivity reasons. And now with proton detection, we can get this down to just one sample a uh, couple of weeks, and now we can apply three-dimensional spectroscopy, uh, which is important to reduce the amount of redundancy that we have fundamentally in the data. And this is the focus now of my group in Göttingen. I'm now, uh, for the last three years, been leading the solid state NMR uh, team in Göttingen uh, in the MPI for biophysical chemistry. And this shows the five different membrane proteins that we are focusing on uh, with a variety of different functions, which I won't have time to go into detail here. Um, but just want to make the point one more time that uh, the, the context of the protein can really matter. And recently, we studied a protein where this is uh, very obvious. This is uh, eight-stranded beta-barrel membrane protein. And 
On the left, you see the structure in lipids. On the, on the right, the structure that we calculated in detergents. Now, many biophysical characterization methods for uh, structural biology make use of these detergents or similar detergents. In this case, it's octoglucoside, which is considered to be a very mild detergent. But in this case, the detergent leads to complete loss of structure at the uh, top of the molecule outside the membrane. And this, of course, leads to a very different conclusion about the possible function of this molecule since uh, we use the structure as an indication for um, a starting point to understand the function in these proteins. So with that, I'd like to summarize. Um, we don't do very many reactions. It's more an analytical lab, but this is a reaction that we really like. We always start off with a sample. We then apply, we pack this sample into very small rotors, apply the fastest spinning we can at the highest magnetic fields we can, and uh, the result of this is a high resolution spectrum. Then in a second step, uh, we apply students' postdocs and we found that free coffee in the department really accelerates this reaction. Um, and we can calculate then structures in a native environment like the one that you see at the right. There are many people to thank and uh, too many to name on one slide, so I just uh, put the pictures up for the main uh, mentors that I've had over the years. And I've also sh uh, shown at the bottom here the solid state NMR group uh, that I've been leading for the last three years. Uh, who I now rely on for uh, many, many things and um, what you've seen today. And of course, none of this would be possible without the many funding agencies. Thanks. Thanks.